subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates the print of the cuff presented by iifl wealth and asset management corporate partner au small finance bank in association with global insurance brokers airline partner spicejet in alliance with indraprasth apollo hospitals on off the cuff today one of the bravest human beings to be to represent the subcontinent when i say subcontinent i treat afghanistan as a part of it and who's this bravest human being from the subcontinent it is saad mohseni saad welcome to off the cuff uh, you have to be really nuts to have started you had a australian passport you were a banker uh, making a bit of money uh, entrepreneur in your own right to come back to afghanistan uh, with your brothers and start of all things a media organization how nutty are you <laughs> well you yeah, well, first you're very kind and uh, thank you and uh, well we went back uh, obviously we saw an opportunity a business <clears throat> opportunity um, and we thought we could contribute to i suppose the development of afghanistan in our own small way uh, setting up a small radio station so uh but uh the business has grown mostly because of the courage and the conviction of so many so many of our fellow afghans uh the hundreds of people who who've worked for us uh, and continue to work for us today and where did you find this young talent because because afghanistan had no journalism schools uh no tradition of journalism uh no publications where did you find them you know we we advertised and dozens and dozens of people showed up uh you know the sad thing today is that uh, you know we're losing these th- thousands of young kids who are fleeing the country uh, is that we're losing our capacity um and the only real asset afghanistan has today uh are uh, our younger educated uh, people uh, who are living in droves and it's uh, it it guts not just our organization but the country itself of of this enormous capacity that's taken us two decades to develop yeah uh, sad you are also somebody uh, who always comes up with a solution instead of just ruining that everything is finished nothing can be done so you are a rare optimist even at this point you are saying that there is an opportunity it's a very tiny sliver of opportunity but there is one to fix things will you explain first of all uh, what is this opportunity uh, and how this can be uh, exploited for towards a good end and also what makes you optimistic i well i we have no choice uh, but to look at the positive or at least what we can do so the country is on the right uh, path or uh, trajectory It, you know things are as they are and we have to accept uh, the reality on the ground the, the taliban have prevailed and we can get into you know into why that happened uh they their victory has been absolute you have some pockets of resistance obviously uh i'm not sure if it's going to amount to much just yet i think a lot of people are just watching the taliban as to how they conduct themselves Uh, before they can you know they they may resist uh, uh, the their rule uh, over the entire country so they have absolute control over the country uh, they're in kabul they have all the major cities um what can we do with them and that's an important question uh, the country is obviously a vastly different country to the one they left behind in 2001 and uh, i think a lot of them realize not all of them a lot of them realize that it's going to be difficult difficult for them to govern without a an inclusive uh, broad based approach a b without the international community and c without the support or at least the uh, the uh, acquiescence of the majority of afghans and particularly the urbanites so i think those realizations hopefully will prompt them to 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 you know to adopt a more as i said inclusive a sort of a more moderate approach to running the country but we don't know uh, and this is the this this is the the thing that we can, that there are no guarantees we have to you know wait and see you know there's this inner uh, tug of war 
uh, transpiring as we speak uh, amongst the Taliban as to, you know, who's going to have what role and what position. And essentially, the Taliban, no different to any other political movement, uh, they have various wings within, within the establishment. Various identities have different views. Some are more pragmatic than others. Let's see how, let's see who's going to end up dominant, A, and B, let's see how inclusive they are in terms of their outreach to other political players. And then let's see how they, you know, what sort of system they're going to adopt. Is, is it going to be a more forward-looking system or it's going to be back to the, you know, the 1990s as sort of a, the North Korea model? And time is of the essence, because I think that if we can't engage them and we corner them, they will snap. And I think that they will they may go back to the sort of default mode of a, sort of a dictatorial, hardcore, ideologically driven um, way of governing the country, which is which is not good for them, which is not good for Afghanistan. It's certainly not good for for the world. Yeah, but what is it that drives the Mujahideen fundamentally? Is it religion? Is it ideology? Is it tribalism? Is it Pashtun Wali or tribal values? Um, is it uh, just a hatred of Americans or any occupiers or foreign forces? What is it? I think it's probably all of the above. And I think that we have underestimated, all of us collectively have underestimated um, A, their appeal and B, the level of frustration and anger with, with the previous regimes. Um, we, you know, I always used to point out that the Taliban's approval rating was about 10 or 15 percent nationally, and it never really got above that. But the irony was that the government's approval rating was always also low. It was around 15, perhaps 20 percent. So, you know, the Afghan people were faced with two really, you know, unpopular options. Um, and it was a bit unfair in the people of Afghanistan. Nonetheless, the Taliban mostly prevailed because, uh, you know, people were not willing to fight for Ashraf Ghani and his government. They, over a seven-year period, uh, politicized the institutions, in particular the military and the police and the intelligence. They did the exact opposite of winning hearts and minds. They actually alienated much of the country. So when push came to shove, when people had the opportunity to stand alongside the military, um, in, say, Badakhshan or in the Northeast or in the West, people just refuse to do that. And, of course, there are many other factors as well. I mean, I think Biden's uh, and the manner that he pulled his troops out, the transition and how what a failure that was. Uh, all of those things also contributed to this failure. But I think let's not forget that the Taliban tapped to something which was, which was very important for them in terms of the anger towards the government, towards the Americans. But it was also driven by ideology and religion. So in addition to tribal factors, you know, when people send their kids to blow themselves up, it's not just about power. Right. Right. And that's what, I mean, if ISKP did what happened in Kabul, that's exactly the motivation that drove that person or those persons to strap bomb belts on their bodies and go up like this in pieces. You know, justice is a really important thing in our culture, as it is in your culture. Um, a, a just government uh, we did not have. Uh, we had corruption. The justice system was 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 a complete failure, um, and 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 I think that you know drew a lot of um, volunteers for you know and continues to for both uh, Al Qaeda for both sorry Taliban as well as ISIS. I think what's interesting is that that's why the, for the Taliban it's going to be very interesting to navigate these two sets of demands, the, the one from the international community in terms of engagement, of moderating their policies, and one from their constituency, which is sort of a hardcore version of Islam. That constituency may be very small, but it's obviously it's very important to them. Um, and the key thing is, how do you convince them to broaden their base? Because if they you know, moderate slightly, but remain true to their core cause, which is about justice for all Afghans, a fairly you know, patriotic movement, then they will perhaps keep, may lose some of their um, supporters, but they would, you know, draw and attract a lot more supporters from the general community. But for them, it's also, you know, it's, it's, it's a competitive landscape. You know, they have ISIS, they have Al-Qaeda, they have various other groups, and they would be mindful of the fragmentation of the Taliban or losing supporters or commanders or fighters to other movements within the country. 
Yeah. Uh, now you set up Tolo, uh, a group of channels, but we are more focused on Tolo News. Uh, that's like an Al Jazeera coming out of Afghanistan because it is not. It, it's not just bringing news to the Afghans, but it's bringing news to the rest of the world about Afghanistan, the Afpak region. And if I may say so, uh, enormously braver uh, than uh, Al Jazeera. Uh, you've decided to stay on. Uh, did you at some point think that it was safer for you to also cut and run and wait for better days? And once again, when maybe Taliban go away, you can come back as you did in 2001? Well, to be honest with you, we were caught by surprise by the by how quickly they came in, and I don't think we had the opportunity to even think it through. Um, I, you know, we, along with everyone else, uh, by, by by the scale of, and the the speed of the collapse of the of the um, system. You know, it's it's uh, it's you know sometimes you have to just make decisions on the uh, you know on the run, so to speak. Um, the Taliban essentially came into Kabul um, on 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 the Monday morning, and um, you know, twelve or thirteen days ago. And for us, it 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 was a scary moment. Uh, I, I I explained that even during the you know the difficult times uh, that we've had in, uh, during Karzai and Ghani's presidencies, we always had some form of a safety net. Uh, we had friends within the government. We had a degree of faith in the judiciary. We had friends in parliament. So we, we had supporters, but also we had supporters within the international community who, who had a lot of leverage with, us, with the government because they funded so many projects. And for them, civil society and freedom of expression was important. All of a sudden, we had no safety net. And we were not sure to, you know, I mean, what would happen if these guys came and took dozens of people away with them, took our equipment? Who do we even call? Um, so that that really is a scary moment. Was a scary moment. It continues, you know. The situation is is not exactly stable. We continue to remain nervous. But I think you know the definition of courage is you know to to have those fears and but to go on and to do the right thing. And our guys continue to actually report on things. Uh, I explained to someone yesterday, and they talked about Ahmad Masood and Panchair, and I said, yeah, yeah, we've had. Uh, Stories about him. I think we even aired one of his interviews and uh, Amrullah Saleh. We said, yeah, we do that. And we have women protesters talking about these issues on TV. And they were surprised. They said, now you do that now? I said, absolutely. So we, we've continued doing our work as we've had, in the, you know, as we've reported in the past. There's been no difference uh, in terms of our editorial line and, and in terms of what we pursue. Uh, you mentioned the uh, to the comparison to Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera rarely, rarely reports on the Qatari royal family. Oh, never. No, no, why, why rarely? Never. So, but, but we do. And we, yeah, we do. aim yeah. to. And uh, tr truth to yeah. power. And, Actually, I stand corrected. Okay. <laughs> um, so we have, we have, you know, and it's challenging for us. I mean, as I mentioned before, we, we, we've lost a lot of people who've opted to leave the country. Um, and I can understand why they would want to do that. And we've helped them. Uh, but at the same time, we have to keep this institution going. And this institution is very unique in that uh, not just our organization, but the entire media sector. I mean, if you go to Eastern Asia, all the way to most of Africa or, and Eastern Europe, we have a freer media, media market, a dangerous one, uh, one that you know we've paid a heavy price um, operating out of, but, but free. And th th this is a huge achievement for, for, for Afghanistan and the people of Afghanistan. So continuing our work is very important, not just to, to, to us, but also to the people of the country in and increasingly for the people outside. Most journalists are leaving. Um, their companies cannot secure, uh, uh, guarantee their security. So we will eventually become the only source of information for both people within and outside the country. Yeah. So tell me something. I'm, I think a lot of people are very curious. Uh, what percentage of your staff, particularly your journalist staff, is female? Well, I have, you know, these numbers are changing so quickly. I have to like look it up. But you know, at one stage it was twenty percent, and but that is a little bit uh, deceptive because we have so many security and logistics people, like drivers and support staff. Uh, right. the, those numbers are higher, especially for management and and um, on air uh, as as well as uh, research. Uh, 
people for 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 the for the for the media outlets. But we had a fairly large, and well, the aim is also to continue that. We've had a fairly large um, presence of women in our organization. It's it's a it's a cause we've championed, and, and it's a it's a cause we believe in. And even going forward, for us, that's a really important achievement for the country. You know, I don't know how much you you've seen in terms of the numbers for Afghanistan in terms of the. Uh, demographics, but 65% of the population is under the age of 20. Yeah. Uh, and these younger Afghans really have grown up in a very different en- environment, and particularly the urbanites. You know, the country is pr- pr- very close to a 50 50 urban rural divide. Uh, so the city dwellers, the people of Kabul, Mazar, Herat, even Khandahar and Jalalabad have a totally different mindset to the generation of their parents and to people living in smaller villages and communities. In fact, that is something which is uh, not sufficiently understood in the rest of the world, including in India. We think India is a very young country because we have a mean age of 28 and a half. Then we notice that Pakistan is younger than us because they have a mean age of 23. I mean, compare that with Italy, which is 46. Uh, But look at Afghanistan. It has a mean age of 18, which means a majority of your people were born after 9-11. So a majority of your people were born after the Taliban had disappeared. So Taliban are coming into another country right now. Well, the irony is that even the Taliban fighters, a majority have never experienced a Taliban type rule. Um, Well, I'm talking about the Taliban 1.0 when there was no television. Obviously, there was no Internet and no social media. Um, But but even these young kids are used, used to using WhatsApp. They consume news using Facebook. They stream news uh, using YouTube clips. So even for them, uh, you know, a, a return to the 1990s Taliban will be completely and totally alien. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question with, from N. Ravi, uh, my friend, a former editor of The Hindu. So you might know. So Ravi has precisely this question that what was the experience of the media during Taliban's previous regime? Well, uh, there was no TV and there was radio Sharia and no internet and uh, and about maybe seven or eight thousand landlines, and you, you know, you fast forward to 2021, a majority of people have mobile phones, probably a third have smartphones, eighty um, percent of people have access to a TV set, ninety seven, ninety eight percent have access to a radio set. People consume. Um, news, content, everything um, through different means. I mean, as a matter of fact, even our policy is that we're sort of device agnostic. I mean, our programming is available everywhere, online, on satellite, on cable, on linear, uh, on the, sorry, on terrestrial. Uh, and hopefully that will continue. But it's a very, very different country. I think the Taliban realize that, given that they come on TV and get interviewed. Yes, uh, and they, they put forward their English-speaking people. There may not be too many of them, but they try that. Yes. Well, they're, they're, they're tech-savvy. I think what, what the challenge for us, well, not challenge, but the, the, the question that we have, I have, is what will, what will they be like once they fully take over? Because right now they don't have a cabinet, they don't have a government. Um, there's obviously... You know, there there are internal discussions or debates within the Taliban. And then the next step would be, uh, how will they engage, you know, non-Taliban politicians or members of the political establishment or others, or even civil society, women's organizations, in terms of a broad-based government or approach um, in the country? And then thirdly, how do do they engage the world? You know, what will Taliban 2.0 represent and how can they convince the world that they will not not go back to the to to the 1990s have they had a conversation with you directly we we have lots of conversations not with me personally but with our people on the ground in kabul and i of course i also talk to people who are close to the taliban um and uh we exchange information and we 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 you know we urge them to you know that the we we, what we are trying to explain to them is that, A, you cannot do this on your own. B, the world has changed dramatically since the old days. You need the world, the outside world, to help you. And you can't just ignore the needs and demands 
of your population. You know, the, the Afghan population has grown from 21 million to almost, almost 38 million. I mean, that's a dramatic change in, in the number of Afghans inside the country. Even the city of Kabul was under a million. Today, it's at 7 million. Yeah, it's, it's a genuine metropolis now. Yes. And, 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 and has the mind and heartbeat of a metropolis. It, yes. And I, I don't think they quite get that. I mean, I just spoke to someone this morning who's close to them, who's had meetings with them. And they, he said, well, you know, they're very slow and they're going to take their time. And they, they, the penny quite hasn't dropped. But his view was the economics will have an impact in terms of, you know, when they run out of money, the, the, the you know, it's good to be uh, a, a sort of an opposition an armed opposition group because you can make money from transportation or drugs or whatever, um, uh, you know, whatever they have at their disposal in terms of taxing people. But all of a sudden, when you're looking after 38 million people, you own the problem. Yeah. And, and hopefully the penny will drop and we'll just get them, you know, there's, there's no, apparently there's no sense of urgency to resolve some of these issues because their mantra to date has been, we'll, we'll wait for the Americans to leave and then we can have a proper think about this. Well, otherwise, the alternative, which is a Saudi Arabia without oil and without literate people, is going to be very, 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 very risky. Yeah, the joke was that in the 90s, there was Saudi Arabia without the fun. Right. <laughs> yes. So, but, but also, this, this new population, these Afghans, are not going to sit by. I mean, unless they become, unless they turn into a Khmer Rouge. Right. Um, and really this dictatorial black and white, you know, you know, way of governing this country. Otherwise, people are going to say, well, what about my right to a job or my ability to go and work if I'm female or, you know, these sorts of things. I mean, you know, listen, democracy is a messy, but it's a wonderful thing. And I think democracy also suits the Afghan psyche. You know, this is our nature. We express ourselves. We're very independent. Um, and. And I think the Taliban, if, if they have the capacity to wait and understand and accept this messiness, it's probably not a bad thing for them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that will that, be some change if it comes about. Now, I've been following, I follow you on Twitter, like so many of us in India. Uh, and I keep track of what you're saying and doing and get many ideas. So I've particularly tracked... Uh, what you said about Taliban visiting your newsroom, your offices, interacting with your people, there are pictures. Uh, were those initial meetings like probing missions or did you see a real change there or, or a real inclination to engage and let you be? I think right now they don't have the bandwidth to deal with so many challenges and particularly the media. And I think it's important for them, A, to, 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 to win hearts and minds and to also convince the world that they have a more moderate approach to things. Uh, they also have this challenge of winning over the, the Afghan political and tribal establishments. Um, so they have to give the right signals that they have changed and they're more flexible now. But, I, you know, it's difficult for us to, to, to buy into it just yet because, you know, we have to wait for the for the government to, to come in. We have to wait for what laws they introduce or what directives they issue in terms of the media. Uh, who's going to be the minister of culture? And they, as I said before, they have their own constituency that will have certain demands. Uh, they're not going to they're not going to be able to ignore those demands. Uh, if they have always maintained that they're against music, it's going to be difficult for them to justify allowing music. Um, public on, in public, whether it's on television or you know weddings or uh, concert halls, so they we just we we it's very difficult to to assume anything just yet. Well, uh, earlier they had a ministry of promotion of virtue and prevention of vice. Uh, they'll come back, and apparently uh, Mutaki has been appointed. They need one of their cute people who's actually more pragmatic than others. But, uh, you know, I think it's going to be, you know, they have, uh, the way that they've, they've managed the movement has been a very consultative process. They have their shoras, their councils, they have their committees. Um, so, I, you know, that's why these decisions are usually made collectively. And I think that 
a collective, it's going to be diff more difficult for them to approve same music or dancing. Yeah. Uh, now, Pakistan, that is the big factor. What kind of a Taliban would Pakistan be willing? I don't want to say allow, but what kind of a Taliban government would Pakistan be happy with? And how, how autonomous would it be willing to let Afghanistan be now or a new Afghanistan government be? I mean, obviously, the, uh, again, I'm, 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 I'm guessing, but my guess would be that Pakistan would want a government in Afghanistan that's going to be focused purely on, on domestic issues. I, I don't think they want an adventurous government in Kabul that would have relationships with its neighbors or the region and would interfere in some of their domestic um, challenges and issues. And I'm not just talking about Pashtunistan or Balochistan, but also you know, relationships with the TTP and others. Um, and they would want, they have people they're close to, uh, the Haqqani network and others, and they'd want those folks to have a prominent role in the government in, in Kabul. Um, they obviously want to have a say on, on whether it's domestic or foreign policy as much as they could. Um, and uh, they've invested heavily in the Taliban. They would want some returns in, on, in, as far as their investments are concerned. But the thing, in, I think one of the things I always mention is there's something about the air in Kabul. I think as soon as you enter the city of Kabul, you, you view things a little bit differently to say how you would view things from Islamabad or Kuwaita or Peshawar. Uh, even we saw this with the Mujahideen in the, in the late 80s mm -hmm. when they came into Kabul, they changed. Probably, perhaps Hikmat Yar was the only one who remained pretty loyal to well, Pindi, but others others had a change of heart because I think a the Afghan Afghans are not, Afghans don't, do not want to be told what to do, and also they 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 have demands of their own country and they have to view things through the prism of what an Afghan would want, uh, rather than what what your major supporters want. And and also I, I think once they get access to the tax revenues of the country and once they get they gain access to international aid. They would be less reliant on the Pakistanis. And from what I understand, Pakistan's leverage over the Taliban has continued to sort of plummet even the last six months. So the Pakistanis would be wise to support an inclusive, broad based um, government in Kabul, a government that's not beholden 100% to the Pakistanis, one that also has relationships with others in the, in the region. And, and also, I think a moderate government in Afghanistan would bode well for, for their own longer term interests. Because I think the last thing you need is, a, is an extreme, extremely radical, ideologically driven government in Kabul, because it, it, that's going to be contagious. This virus, this sort of extreme, um, whether it's Islam or any other religion, is contagious. And I think that uh, the entire region is going to be vulnerable. And, you know, the TTP. I'm sure is very excited and so are so many other groups, the IMU and the Uyghurs in China and the Chechens. There are a lot of them. Someone was mentioning eight to 10,000 foreign fighters have arrived in Kabul over the last six to 12 months. Because if Pakistan is not careful, this would again become a university of jihad. Well, you know, we're talking about the Harvard of jihad and Harvard and Oxford and Cambridge mixed in together. So Harvard, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this is and 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 I think and I think that there are people in Pakistan, no doubt, that have buyer's remorse, and I think the speed, you know, of the collapse of the system, I, I think has caught everyone by by surprise, including the Pakistanis. It's, it's like, what do we do now? See, uh, and I, and I, heard, I mean, a, a friend of mine was telling me the day Kabul fell, that there are all these groups out in Punjab and Lahore destroying statues. Yes, you know, in, this, including this have consequences for everyone, including yeah. Maharaja Ranjit Singh. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, and and that was uh, that was Tariq El Labak. Now, uh, on the issue of Pakistan, I mean that is if Pakistan thinks reasonably. The problem with Pakistan is who's doing the thinking. So if GHQ is doing the thinking, then I'll push the envelope and repeat a line which I've used often, even on a family channel. Uh, staying reasonably vague. Uh, 
that the problem with the Pakistani GHQ is that their strategic mind, strategic, strategic minds don't sit in their heads. They sit in some other part of their anatomy because they are always thinking India, India, India. It's a blood feud for them. Uh, so will they drag, uh, will they still try to drag Afghanistan into it? Or do you think, uh, you just said that their influence has plummeted over the past six months. Uh, or do you think that they've seen the writing on the wall? Well, it depends on who at GHQ. I'm sure that, I, I, you know, I, not that I know him, but from what I hear, General Bajwa is much more pragmatic in his thinking. But the colonel level guy who's been sitting on the Afghan desk may have a totally different mindset. And, and will that guy even listen to his superiors if instructed? So I, I don't know enough about the institution, the, the military in Pakistan. I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm just guessing that even in Rahul Pindi, uh, they're, you know, they, they have different you know, strategies in terms of how to deal with this. So at least their thinking probably is not the same. I, I think the... the and, and you can see that. I mean, I think the Haqqanis were very quick to get to Kabul before the Qandaris. Uh, and I think part of the reason may have been that they wanted to cement their position in the city of Kabul before the others arrived, before the cavalry arrived. And I would suspect the Mullah brother, having spent many years in a pa Pakistani prison, will be slightly more independent in his thinking. There wouldn't be much love lost between him and some of the people that locked him up and tortured them. Um, and I, at the end of the day, most Afghans are patriots, even if they had to rely on Pakistan for two decades. So I think, you know, there'll be, I think there'll be some su surprises in Pakistan. And Pakistanis have always taken pride that if it's not the Taliban, that they can back another organization or, you know, or force a fragmentation of this movement or get others to support, say, ISIS and others. But for how long? Hmm. You know, for how long can you do this for? without completely destroying your own country? Well, they've done a very good job of it for the past 40 years. Uh, the first time I went to Pakistan, which is about 40 years back, Pakistan's per capita income was 65% higher than India's. Today, it's about 40% lower. In fact, Bangladesh is now not just way higher than Pakistan. <laughs> this year, it's higher than India as well. So Pakistanis have done a good job of this. But nevertheless, let's leave that behind. Uh, music. Now, music and Islam, this is one of those eternal debates. So I raised this question with one of our greatest musicians, uh, Ustad Bismillah Khan, uh, who got our highest national award, Bharat Ratna. Uh, he was a Shanai player. <clears throat> and some Malvis in Iran had questioned him and said that what he's doing is un-Islamic. So I asked him what he had to say on this. And he said, look, how does the, how does the Malvi give a call to the faithful for namaz. He gets on top of the masjid and he makes his call in music. And he says, unless you, unless you make your call in a musical way, even God would not listen to you. Do you go up and say, hey, come all the faithful, let's pray. Not like that. Uh, you have to say it with music. So, uh, so what is this ideological thing about Islam and music? Well, it depends on the, on the interpretation, and I'm not going to weigh in because I'm not an expert, and I'll get myself into trouble if I do. But but this debate's been going, you know, it's been ongoing, and we've had these discussions on our TV station in, in terms of, you know, what is acceptable and what's not. What's interesting that the Taliban do allow not, which is yes, something without actually music in the background. So technically, I suppose you can chant. Um, I'm sure we're going to have these debates. And actually, this issue was raised at a press conference with Zabiullah Mujahid. And Zabiullah Mujahid said, we have to, there was a group of, uh, a sort of, you know, some leader of some music, you know, musicians association got up, some union leader got up and said, what about us musicians? And Zabiullah Mujahid, in a charming and, and, and gentle way, said, that we'll, find, we'll have to find you another vocation. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, not that, you know, I mean, um, uh, and, uh, you know, he was very diplomatic. Listen, that's, uh, you know, that's, they've drawn the line on the sand in terms of music. So actually, it's one of the few things that I think that they will definitely ban, um, simply because it's been it's so closely associated with the previous regime that if they don't, I think their supporters would, would be most upset. 
Uh, we, we, by the way, on day one, we dropped our musical programs um, and our music clips uh, simply because we thought that we didn't want to risk the lives of our people. And plus, right. we think that that's important. Uh, people can download them on YouTube, but news is important for us. So news we've continued um, unchanged. So we are on religion. I have a question from Sulochana Patak, who's one of our subscribers, who says that religion is, seems to be the hot button issue right now. But how has this war influenced the relationship between people of Afghanistan with their religion, both in the hinterlands and in the cities? Well, I think religion, I mean, Afghans have always been very, um, let's, let's call them mystical. Uh, we have been believers, but we haven't been, you know, you know as sadly, we have become since the 1980s when billions of dollars from the Americans and the Saudis radicalized an entire generation. But prior to that, Afghans were always very philosophical about religion. It was important to them. It guided them. Uh, but there was something very wonderful. And, you know, Sufism, which is, is something that sort of links uh, the subcontinent with Central Asia, continues to remain very important to us. And, you know, whether it's poetry or through chanting, um, it's, 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 its foundation is Islam. But the form of Islam that, that my parents' uh, generation practiced is obviously very alien to perhaps the supporters of the Taliban. But I think, I think we will go back to that. I think that even I've seen a change over the last two decades that, you know, there's, a, there's an openness to people too. There's this sort of intellectual humility, I think, you know, not to be so black and white and so, um, what's, what's, what's a phrase, and, and unaccepting of other sects, of other religions, of other people, of other cultures. And I think that sort of, intellectual humility. I think the media has played an important role. We've always had debates about these issues, but in a very constructive way. Um, and uh, to be very dogmatic, I mean, even in our culture, you know, you talk about the tree that, that the, the tree that refuses to bend will eventually get broken by the winds of life. Um, and I think this also is important for people in their character in terms of how open and accepting they should be, which they are, by the way. I'm, I'm curious about your use of the comparison Khmer Rouge. Will you elaborate on that? And nobody is wishing that the Taliban should go that way. But will you elaborate on that? So my concern is that if we don't engage with the Taliban, because there are pragmatic characters and identities within the movement who are willing to work with the world, and if they get cornered and cornered and cornered, that something will snap. And that will empower the more radical elements within the organization, within the movement. And they will have a very dogmatic approach to, to everything, from religion to the way that people should conduct themselves and how people should work. And because it's, the, it's their default mode, so to speak. It's very easy to say you can do either A or B. And as I said, democracy is messy. So for them to have a sort of a laissez-faire approach to, 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 to governance in the country it's probably, it, it runs to the contrary to the way that they've usually conducted themselves because they've used, you know, they, they, to date over the last 20 years, they've only, you know, they've only governed over or in small districts and small villages and small towns where you can have that sort of a dogmatic approach to things, but not in major cities. So the concern that I have is that when you go that far in terms of, um, of, of strict controls over your people, the danger always is that you become more like a Khmer Rouge than a, you know, sort of a, an, an, a slightly moderate government. And the, the problem is that then it just gets more and more vicious. I'm not saying that's going to what, what that's what we'll see immediately. But over time, the danger is that if a country is isolated and people are resentful and then they have to maintain more control and then there's less money and less aid and, you know, they become a pariah state, more sanctions. They can't move out of the country. They can't travel. It'll just progressively make things worse in terms of the lives of the people on the ground, but also in, in terms of the way that they will conduct themselves within the country and treat their own people. Because they walked in without any resistance. So it looks like people didn't so detest them that they would come out and throw stones at them. But what's happened also does not 
seem like a liberation, although Imran Khan called it that, but it doesn't seem like that. Nobody's come out welcoming them, nobody's embracing and hugging them, unless it's happening deep in the countryside and we don't see those pictures. Although in these times, uh, somebody would make sure that those pictures also come out. Well, I think uh, I think a lot of people are waiting and, you know, they've, they've adopted this wait and see approach. Whether it's from, you know, whether it's military, former military commanders, um, you know, the Northern Lies types, whether it's like other opposition types, whether it's civil society, uh, even people like us, we're waiting, you know, we're waiting and we're watching. Um, they would be wrong to assume that there will be no opposition. Hmm. Um, and I think a lot of people, there's, I'm, I'm not saying there's a lot of goodwill, but there's, you know, perhaps, this, they're, they're being given this opportunity to show everyone that, uh, um, that they're willing to compromise, that they're willing to include others, that they're willing to engage with the world, and they're willing to listen to their own people. I, and I think there's this genuine, if you talk to people in Badakhshan or in Balkh, and I've spoken to people in Herat and also in other parts of the country, they are willing to give them a chance. And I think this is why this window of opportunity is so important for us. Yeah. So I have a question from Colonel Vishwanathan, who is a uh, who is a veteran. This is, but it's not a question about anything strategic, strategic, but media business. Mm. He says you need free media, but free media also needs an economics. Uh, so in a country like Afghanistan now, particularly now, how do you sustain a free media organization, an organization, a news organization that puts out accurate news? That's a good question. I mean, at the moment, uh, the banks are closed, the money is frozen, uh, there are no ads. Um, but the one thing actually the Taliban have been good at, it's actually in their DNA is to support the private sector. Um, the, the Taliban movement actually, when it was created, was essentially supporting the transportation companies to get goods in and out of the country. Even now, sorry, even, even before the takeover of Kabul, if you had a chit from the Taliban for having brought goods in, that chit was good uh, throughout the country. Whereas if you receive, if you pay taxes to a police officer or bribes, I should say, uh, you would be bribed again within a couple of kilometers and so forth and so forth. So the Taliban's uh, approach to taxing people to their support of the private sector has always been good. But then we also need an open country. We need um, people to feel free. We don't need sanctions. There are a whole range of other factors that could contribute to an economy's or should will contribute to, to an economy's growth. And that's going to be the key challenge for them. See, we have three crises. We have a political crisis, which we're all observing. We have a humanitarian crisis with so many people looking to get out, so many internally displaced people, you know, with six, 700,000 people. So we hear. Um, and then we have this economic crisis. I mean, the currency is in a free fall. I asked someone, I said, if you, you know, were to buy U.S. dollars, and they said, there, there are no U.S. dollars. All the Sarafis, the exchange people, are not showing up to work. The banks are closed. A lot of the shops are closed. So for the Taliban to get the economy going again, people need to have confidence. And that's why it's important for them to engage. Yeah. Uh I have Hemant Mundhara, who is a who lives in UAE, so not far from where you are. Uh, who says is there a larger game plan for the US for Afghanistan vis-a-vis -vis their strategy with China? Because it looks like for the US now, Taliban are the good guys. Uh, Taliban are the new Mujahideen of 1979-1989, uh, isn't it? And now ISIS are the bad guys. Uh, so Taliban are like the allies now. What do you, how do you see this playing out? I think for the Chinese and the Pakistanis and the Russians and the Iranians, you know, many of them are saying, how the hell do we manage this? You know, the Americans and their money and their clout, uh, their physical presence in terms of military. Um, this is the wealthiest, uh, most powerful country on the planet. And if they had difficulties managing this, no one else has a chance. So that's why it's also important for the world to come together. And I, in my op-ed, I've called for a UN Security Council man, uh, sanctioned uh, mandated position for a special envoy to come in and get involved. It's, it's you know, the Chinese just with their money or the Russians just with their bullying or the Iranians with their militias, it's going to be very difficult for them. And 
also the case for the Pakistanis. This is the Financial Times op-ed you're talking about. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I, I will share a link of that with the description of this video. Yeah. Thank you. So, so it's, it's very important for the world. I, I think a lot of people realize that. I think whether you go to Beijing or Moscow, Moscow or, or, or Tehran, they will acknowledge probably that this is going to be a challenge. I mean, they're not going to be able to manage this country on their, on their own. Um, and if they do, they're, they're being very naive and, uh, and th they will pay a price for it if they think they can come in and manage things and take over from the Americans. That vacuum needs to get filled, but no single country can fill that vacuum. Well, uh, you know, I sometimes say outrageous things to, to be provocative, but, but not, not fake. They come from the heart. So in 2010, in my weekly column, uh, I said the headline was leave F to park. That if the Pakistanis think they can now fix Afghanistan, let them try. Because in every century, the preeminent global power of the century has tried and met its Waterloo in Afghanistan. Uh, or maybe some Afghan equivalent of Waterloo might be more telling. Uh, so there were the British, Imperial Britain in the 19th century. There was uh, the Soviet Union in the 20th century. And now there's been America in the 21st century. So the Pakistanis think that they can do it, be my guest. Uh, but at the end of this, there are also nearly 40 million Afghan people now. And they are human beings and we've seen they are enormously talented people. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a vastly different country to, to um, even I think in 2010 when, Ten years. When, when you wrote about this. You know what? What what happens in Afghanistan doesn't necessarily stay in Afghanistan, and I think the Europeans realize that. Um, you know, we expect one and a half. Well, sorry, the UN expects one and a half to two million refugees to leave the country this year, and this was a prediction uh, about a month, month and a half ago when I spoke to them. Those numbers will surely be higher. What will they end up? You know, people forget we're two countries away from Europe. Yes, one Turkey, and then the EU. Yeah, we, you know, and for for the Germans, for example, with the exception of one year, we have been the, the biggest contributor every single year when it comes to refugees. Um, drugs, you know, 40 percent of heroin in Europe comes from Afghanistan. And of course, terrorism of the eight, 10,000 fighters, foreign fighters fighting in Afghanistan. If not today, you will get Europeans who will come along for the ride. You know, these. Uh, yeah adventure junkies who've been um, who found their second calling in terms of extreme Islam will we'll start showing up to Afghanistan and so I think for the Europeans in particular it's very important to to remain engaged and I think this is why the mistake um, that a lot of people make is to assume that if they leave Afghanistan alone they end up they end their own forever war that the war will stop as well in Afghanistan and the radicalization of Afghanistan is in no one's interest. And if this economy just completely falls by the wayside, that's in no one's interest. And anarchy, <coughs> sorry, is in no one's interest. <coughs> in particular, the, the region. So I think um, we all have to be pretty wise, having learned from the mistakes of the past. Uh, and figure out ways to deal with it. And India should engage, and India should engage soon and quickly. Uh, I, I went to the Racina conference a couple of years ago, and I met with some of your government people. I said, why, don't, why aren't you meeting with the Taliban? Um, and, and I would stress that point again, because India, there's a lot of goodwill towards the, uh, the country, India, and the people of India, and even the Indian government. And, um, and India, you know, to, I mean, to this day remains the favorite destination for most Afghans. They love Indian content. They prefer Indian clinics. They prefer Indian tertiary institutions and schools. Uh, they prefer visiting India to any other country in the region. So I think there, there's a place for, for India and your government and the people of India and civil society to engage more. So it's not, it's wrong to say, I also have a question for Captain Anil Panjwani. Uh, about the good work that India has done in Afghanistan. Uh, first of all, he wants to know, do enough people in Afghanistan know that India has done some good work? And second, and I'm adding to it, 
there is also a school of thought a lot of it comes from pakistan that so many billions spent by india have gone down down the drain well i think it's very visible you've done some you know you've done you know uh, whether it's a power plant or um creating the transportation hubs you know with its railways or uh, roads uh, our parliament building i think enough's been done the only criticism i've had to date is that india's backed individuals rather than institutions you know there's certain people that were your favorites and you think that they can serve your national interest by supporting them and i've always been critical of that uh, every opportunity i've had both public and private have conveyed my concerns that listen think of afghanistan as a longer term partner and um no matter who's in kabul they will reach out to the indians and you watch this new government they will also reach out to the indians it's just a question of time but i think your commitment should be more to the people of afghanistan and to the institutions which which you know i'm not saying that hasn't been the case judging by the amount of assistance you've given the afghans um but that should continue the indians should not lose hope were you surprised by the way ghani cut and ran or did you always expect this i i was not surprised um but i was i was surprised uh i thought that at least he would create some sort of a narrative he didn't um and and the, the thing with ghani was that uh, if you watched afghan media uh, like the weeks preceding the collapse of the government every single day he would come out and say unlike others i will stay here and die in this country i prefer the cemetery to xyz and it's a bit like when someone always when someone says i'm i'm the most honest man you'll meet uh, you've met you know that that person is a crook so with rani as well because he kept on saying it i felt well this guy if it if he gets the opportunity he'll be the first one to run i mean what he did was not just shocking it triggered the collapse yeah of, of of the system itself because as soon as it was announced and sadly we broke the story because we had no choice um ministers abandoned their posts police officers took off their uniforms immigration officers went home it, it was just chaos and this whole, the scenes at the airport could have been avoided there was a commitment to meet in doha which dr abdullah uh, former president hamid kazai was expected to attend the Taliban had vowed not to enter the city, which I believe, because they just didn't have the capacity to, to police the city. Um, the international community had secured these commitments from everyone so that we would have a period. They, said, they had said two weeks, but I th- I'm sure they could have extended that the, you would have a, an interim or a transitional administration that would oversee the departure of the old guard and the entry of the new guard and then you would have your police intact you'd have your military intact you'd have your ministries intact and there would be no sense of panic so the guy working in the tax office would have no need to run away because he knew that the world was watching he knew that this was an orderly transition by abandoning and running away like he did is not only cowardly it's i mean it's treason you can't leave you can't push your people under the bus like that and these allegations of you know millions of dollars in duffel bags which you know we've we have some some reliable sources who've con- confirmed um, the the tra- these transfers of large quantities of cash are even more reason uh to hold rani and his entourage accountable I, right now we're so busy with the airport evacuation and what's transpiring on the streets of kabul but the time will come um and and also you have to ask your government how much cash you gave ashraf money you've given him over the last 2 or 3 years what do you do with this cash is there any accountability from the indian side and we have to ask all our allies these questions you know how much did you help this individual rather than institutions in afghanistan when you said <clears throat> that india earned in backing individuals over institutions this is the point you were making that india chose ghani and actually you are saying that india gave ghani a lot of cash i don't know who's given him the cash he's they certainly had a lot of cash in the palace and of course in afghanistan you have to use cash you know you, you know, some tribal chief wants to go to india for medical check up you know he's given a little bit of cash for the president's office cash is obviously most people don't have bank accounts you know and most people don't have access to a credit card so cash is the best way of 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 making payments in the country but yes i think those questions should be asked of you know of different governments of how much cash 
was given to, to Rani um, and the World Bank and IMF and others have to investigate what was taken out of the central bank. I see the central bank governor giving speeches. I mean, people forget that he's, he's related to Ashraf Rani. Um, and he's, he also has to answer some questions. I mean, if they took out, you know, the Russians have claimed 160 million, but let's assume it's 50 million. Where the hell did they get this money from? Even yeah. if it's 5 million. Right. That belongs to the state and the people of Afghanistan, not to Ashraf Ghani and his own too yeah. And equally, were you surprised that Amrullah Saleh did not flee and that he is now hanging out in Panjshir Valley and actually showing determination to fight? And what are his chances? Well, Amrullah Saleh uh, has, has always been very vocal. He's uh, always to this ground. He's survived a number of assassination attempts. Um, he's a principled individual. Um, but we also have to be a realistic Panjshir, which during Amachar Massoud's time survived because they had links to Central Asia, it was connected to Central Asia. Um, they had supporters uh, who were helping them, uh, the Indians and Iranians and the Russians and some others, I think towards the end, the Americans. Uh, and he had a history. <clears throat> he, he's, he's viewed as one of the great military strategists of the last century. Absolutely. Uh, and he led from the front. Amrullah Saleh is not a military man. He's a political leader. But even in Panjshir, I would suspect that um, Ahmad Massoud has a bigger say on all things politics because he has the support of his people because of his dad mostly. But also I think he's invested a lot of time and effort in winning, winning people over. We also have a very large contingent, contingent of special forces, uh, troops in, in, in Panjshir and heavy weapons. And Amrullah is not a military guy, so they don't have that direct relationship with him. So there are probably different individuals there. Amrullah perhaps is, is an important figure in terms of, you know, he has uh, resources and can, can help out. Uh, but there are other leaders. And, you know, I know that they're in discussions with the Taliban. They've had um, um, delegations going back and forth. Panjshir, a battle for Panjshir will be bloody from all sides, and it's not going to be an easy place to conquer. So I think people are trying to figure out if there's a sort of a middle way where you can secure certain rights for the people there. Um, and and I, I'm pretty sure the Taliban also realize that it's, uh, you know, they don't want to get a bloody nose by attempting to conquer Panjshir and fail. Uh, and also the Panjshiris would realize they don't want to jeopardize the lives of so many innocent people who live in the valley, who are very impoverished. The Panjshiris in Panjshir are not the wealthiest people. So why force them to go through this, you know, this, this tragedy? So, so hopefully common sense will prevail. Let's just see. Again, this will be another test of the Taliban. I know it's Taliban 2.0 different to the previous one. Yeah. So last question, I know you have to go. Uh, from my colleague, Sajid Ali Mir, <clears throat> who wants to know, do you think U.S. media did a successful job of normalizing the Taliban as an entity with which the West could negotiate. For example, Sirajuddin Haqqani's op-ed in the New York Times or jargon changing or, or jargon changing from ter terrorist to Islamist group, etc., etc. This happened sort of serendipitously, but very, uh, very obviously. I think you have to blame the government. I mean, they went to negotiate with the Taliban and did a deal with them in February of 2020. They normalized the Taliban. Um, you know, the, 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 the big debate was that if you're going to allow them to, to come in like the way you have, why not just leave? Don't release their prisoners. Don't legitimize them. Uh, there was a scramble. I mean, every diplomat and foreign minister was breaking the world record to get to Doha and to shake hands with the Taliban and take pictures with them. So I think you can blame the US government for doing that. Um, and, and, and of course the US and other international media would also quick jump on, you know, on the bandwagon. But I think the reality is that the Taliban did influence, had a great deal of influence in the country. They had support, especially in rural Afghanistan. You cannot, you cannot ignore that. And I think the Americans with the benefit of hindsight, of course, because at the time, none of us realized this, their operations in the South in terms of arresting people, sending them to Guantanamo, night raids, um, attacks on, you know, that resulted in civilian deaths. All of these, these actions incrementally um, 
you know, help the Taliban grow their supporter base. And uh, so the lesson learned, and I think the lesson learned from from this, you know, the last 20 years is, is the Americans were, you know, they supported a fairly corrupt regime. And the regime used the presence of the Americans to target its enemies. Uh, and the Americans were naive and they didn't fully understand the country and its dynamics and its, you know, the social fiber. And, uh, and, and you, know, you remember the stories of wedding parties getting attacked because some guy just sort of slipped a piece of note to an American Air Force guy. And the Americans said, hey, we're going to get the Al-Qaeda guys. And it was, they would just attack the wedding ceremony. And there were dozens of these sorts of examples just, you know, every month. And Anyway, there'll be books and books written about what went wrong and mistakes we made, but um, but but certainly that that narrative changed after the, the deal with the Americans in 2020. Yeah, do you have a view on the tone that tone of Biden's statements uh, around time of Kabul's fall uh, and now after the bombings? I think I think. Biden, Biden's mumbling responses uh, have been very disappointing. And, you know, someone, uh, Ed Luce and the FT wrote that uh, this could be a Jimmy Carter moment. Yes. Uh, and I think the fact that Biden just seems so old and so fragile and these challenges, you would suspect that the American public would want a leader that can take charge. And the feeling you get by watching him, and you know, I have an older father, and you know, we love and respect him. But, but I'm, do I want my father to be, you know, managing a crisis? The answer is no. And uh, and I think with Biden as well, I think the 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 feeling that I get talking to a lot of my friends who are Democrats is that, you know, he not, he he may not be up to the job. And I think the other problem is that the people around him are loyalists. And, you know, you, you talk, you look at the great secretaries of state, for example, you look at uh, Henry Kissinger, who I've had the honor of spending time with, or you look at Jim Baker, or you look at others, or even Hillary Clinton, they, they stood, you know, uh, opposite the president, almost as an equal, as equals, they could push back and they could challenge him. But I think, you know, does Blinken, does he even have the capacity or capability to do that? And will someone like Joe Biden listen to him? Uh, or others within the administration, or the you know the the Secretary of Defense. I mean, he's viewed generally by the military folks that I'm close to as weak, and not one that can push back with the president. So I think, again, many books will be written about this so-called war cabinet and their ability to manage this crisis. The scenes at the airport were avoidable, totally avoidable. This is on the U.S. president and also on the Afghan president for fleeing the way he did. But this whole process was, has been so badly managed and they could have managed this better. They've had 20 years to plan for this. And yeah. they screwed up. So Saad, many books will be written. When will yours be written? <laughs> uh, I can barely put together an article. <laughs> well, um, keep writing and keep speaking because you know it's so important to have... Uh, a reasonable voice is coming out because reasonable voices also have to be realistic. Uh, reasonable voices can't be on this extreme or the other. So once again, thank you for speaking out. Thank you for keeping the smile on your face. Uh, and thank you for keeping a, the hardest of hard acts going in Afghanistan. We can only try. Yeah. Thank you again. And we can only wish you well, and I hope we stay in touch. And if there's anything that we can do together between the print and Tolo, we are always there as partners. And we must, we must. Thank you. Thank you, Saad. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you for your time. Thank you. you too. The print off the cuff, presented by IIFL Wealth and Asset Management, corporate partner AU Small Finance Bank, in association with global insurance brokers, airline partner SpiceJet, in alliance with Indraprasth Apollo Hospitals. 